You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the Unsolved Colonial Parkway Murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. I'm Bill Thomas. And we'd like to start off this week by praising our friends at Othram Labs, who have again had an amazing success breaking a cold case, this one out of Canada. And this is the case of Christine Jessup, who at nine years old went off to meet a friend at a park in Queensville, Ontario. This was in October of 1984. She never made it to that park. Several months later, her body was found in Sunderland, Ontario. She had been stabbed to death and sexually assaulted as well. It's a terrible case, and she was only nine years old at the time of this murder. And many, many people in Toronto and throughout Canada remember this case as being so tragic, and particularly for people that were kids back then, they remembered this horrible story and how it was used as a cautionary tale. It's just, just awful. You know, and you actually get another level of tragic in with this one because a next door neighbor by the name of Guy Paul Morin was, despite his assertions of innocence, uh, convicted of the crime and spent two years in jail as a result, only to be exonerated in 1995 with the use of DNA technology. And that was the limit of the DNA technology at that time. And in 2019, Toronto law enforcement approached Othram Labs and our friends, the Redgraves, Lee and Anthony Redgrave, who were working with Othram at that time, they led the forensic genealogy team that began the analysis of the available DNA ultimately through a lot of work and very close work with the Toronto police were able to identify a suspect named Calvin Hoover. Who had died by suicide in 2015. So in this case, we are not able to see a killer put behind bars, but it is so great that there is finally a name put to this horrific crime. There is something personally I find very dissatisfying about this outcome. Losing Christine Jessup as a nine-year-old girl is tragic. And then this very frustrating situation where Mr. Morin was charged and convicted and and then ultimately exonerated, and then finally to identify this suspect who killed himself five years ago. I did think that the, the Toronto police did something very graceful and thoughtful, which is that they apparently went and met with Mr. Morin before this announcement came out. Can you imagine going through life, even though he was ultimately exonerated and paid over a million dollars Canadian in a lawsuit and a wrongful conviction, the police came and met with him and told him that they had ultimately found the right suspect in uh, this Calvin Hoover. Yeah, it was a very classy move on their part. I mean, I'm sure that he does feel finally a sense of satisfaction in knowing that this has been solved definitively. So congratulations to our friend at Othram Labs for the excellent work that they continue to do on helping to crack cold cases. You guys are doing amazing work. We can't thank you enough for all of your hard work and effort. And speaking of Othram, we wanted to touch base on the Brianna Maitland case that you remember that Brianna Maitland is the beautiful 17-year-old girl who went missing in Vermont. And we are trying to assist Othram in raising funds to cover the costs of the DNA analysis in that case. And we're pleased to report we're at $2,369 funded so far. We have a $5,000 goal there. So we're almost halfway there. We hope that you'll consider going to dnasolves.com and providing funding, if possible, whatever you can afford. We've both contributed, and we hope that you will too. We also hope that you'll consider donating your DNA to the dnasolves.com website, which is used by Othram to assist law enforcement to find missing persons 
And then, of course, identifying perpetrators in cases like the Christine Jessup case. So we hope that you'll consider making a financial or DNA donation or both. We are very much looking forward to having Brianna's father, Bruce Maitland, on the show in just a couple of weeks. So please look out for that episode. We were thrilled to be able to talk to him. Sponsors for our show, of course, are our friends at Othram Labs. And we are also happy to have a new sponsor on board. This is Boston Green Health. So for all of your rest and relaxation needs, go to bostongreenhealth.com and use our promo code MOM20 to get a discount on your order from Boston Green Health. As always, we want to thank you for your ratings and reviews. We're working on episode 39 as we speak here. So we're almost at 40 weeks of putting together this podcast. Please tell your friends about us and give us a good rating and or review on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you so much for listening to Mind Over Murder. And here is part two of our interview with Gemma Hoskins of The Keepers. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. Back for a second episode with Gemma Hoskins, star of Netflix's The Keepers. Gemma, welcome back. Thank you. But I want to clarify something. I am not a star. (laughs) I'm the big mouth because I know most people who have seen The Keepers, they remember me and they remember Gene. Gene, because it was Gene. And Gemma, because I probably never shut up, and I'm very out there. <laughs> I'm out there in the world, and I'm okay with that. But Gene is the hinge between the murder and the abuse. And so I think if people were like, who's the face of the keepers? It's going to be her and then Gemma after that. So I'm, I'm not a star. I'm just appreciative that I've gotten so much positive feedback from people who want to see something done. I mean, I think the women of the Keepers were largely responsible for the Me Too movement. And, you know, I'm sorry, Jean was not the uh, time woman of the year, but she's so humble and has such a low profile that she never would have promoted herself that way. But anyway, that's a whole different, whole different story. Well, you're a star in our world. That's for sure. Thank you. (laughs) Hey, we want to talk about your book a little bit. Tell us about keeping on your new book, which comes out November 2nd, right? Okay. The retail release date is November. Not sure what date yet. But the book is actually available now. It's been available since the beginning of the middle of August. I had a number of copies sent directly to me. And I'll give it a plug. If anybody would like a signed copy, they can private message me on Facebook. I'm not hard to find. Gemma Hoskins. I don't know if there's too many people with that name, but they'll find me. And I can ship them one. And I get a reduced shipping rate for Canada and the rest of the world because I'm using a um, a really good shipping program. Anyway, so Keeping On has a subtitle. The subtitle is How I Came to Know Why I Was Born. And I don't want that to sound trite because everybody's like, oh, that's so cute. Well, no, it's not. About a couple of years into our investigation, I started to get this feeling like this is what I'm supposed to be doing because I was successful with finding answers. And I thought, how weird is it that you always wonder why you're here and you want to have a purpose? And so it kind of came on slowly. But when The Keepers actually was released, I tried to separate my feelings from like all the accolades and, the you know, you're on Netflix and you're this and you're that from what I really felt in my heart. And I really do believe, I'm not religious, but I have faith. I really do believe that at the age of 67, this is why I was born. So the book is in three parts. The first part is a little bit about what people already know. It's not a retelling of the keepers, but it's how I got into it. And then the middle part of the book, part two, is a memoir I can remember clearly back to when I was two years old without a problem. And I would ask my mom when certain things happened. 
as an adult so that I could make sure it was when I was two. And I was right. So it's the good things and the bad things that happened to me. It's not a sob story. It's not feel sorry for me. It's what gave me my gut and my heart and my soul. And it's made me keep on. So I've been through some really crappy stuff. I lost my husband to cancer when we were both 35. I lost my dad suddenly a week after my high school graduation. And so I, I just kept one foot in front of the other. And then the last part of it is what I'm doing now and what I'm going to continue to do and the people that are making it happen like you guys, because you're both in the book. I don't know if you found your name yet. Oh, I did. Now, Kristen has her copy of the book. I don't have my copy of the book yet, but I will Um, pre-order. Why don't we just, why don't I just send you one today? Well, thank you, but I'm, I'm good for it. I, I, I pay my way. (laughs) You don't have to pay pay me for it. You don't No, I can send you a gift. Well, it's a gift. Thank you. you. Okay. I'm not going to do that to everybody that's listening. (laughs) No, send me your address when we're finished and I'll send you a gift. Okay. So anyway, so it's in the warehouse. So people are buying it. It's published by Mascot Books and people are buying it from their warehouse or from me signed. And then the retail release date is November. And at that time, it will be available. Amazon is taking pre-orders. Right. It will also be available as an audible book with my narration. I, oh, wow. I found, yeah. Right. I, found a record, I found a recording studio here on the Eastern Shore. Uh-huh. And I spent like eight or nine two-hour sessions right. there. Like right. About as long as my voice would hold out. Yeah. And I, the guy had done music before, but never a book. Mm-hmm. But he and his girlfriend had seen The Keepers. So they're like, we're in. So I hired him and went to his studio for about two months. Uh And we finished the Audible version. And that's in the hands of the publisher already. They would have done it, but I didn't want somebody else narrating my story. Right, right. Because it's in first person and they have narrators. But I said, no, I want to do it. And they said, well, then you'll need to find your own person. So I did. And then in lieu of large print, I am having an ebook like for Kindles. So a lot of people have said, like my p- people my age have said, I can't read the print. <laughs> so I said, well, wait for the ebook and you can change the font. So it will be available in those three versions. Right. It will also be at Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, Ingram Distributors, and then a number of smaller bookstores you know it's hard to find a real bookstore anymore oh sure Uh, yeah a number of bookstores in the uh rehoboth delaware delmarva area Mm -hmm. because i i think it's a local story i'm a local person i got my bomber accent so that's what will happen in november and i have three more books coming one is almost finished and the other two are in my head wow wow Gemma. I know. It it pours out of me. Once I got the proposal done, which is the hardest part, Mm -hmm. then you just write. I had no block writing. I love to write. And some of the chapters were very, very difficult for me to put down in writing. And I like cried the whole time I was doing it. But, (laughs) you know, it was. Have you read it yet, Chris? Oh, yeah. I, I was telling Bill before we went on the air with you that I, I actually I cried my way through the chapter about you losing yeah. your husband. Oh, no. well, yes. And, and I kept putting that one off. And then I waited until a day when I had no other commitments. I had somebody take my dog for me for the day and I just let it roll. Mm-hmm. And um, so there will be two more books about this experience. And then the next one actually is about Teddy. It's called Teddy Tales, a puppy primer. <laughs> and then it's like a hardback gift book for people who have gotten their first dog as an adult. So How it's, cool. anecdotes, it's anecdotes and poems interspersed with like funny but practical advice. And all the artwork is being contributed by his fans from Facebook who know about him from the keepers. I am oh, so thrilled. I saw that. And all Teddy. of those people, Teddy Tales, T A L E S, a puppy primer. And so I'm going <laughs> to 
I'm signing a contract with Mascot again to do mm-hmm. this one. Mm-hmm. And it will be like 30 pages maybe. And so all this artwork is coming to me. And the, everybody knows what size it has to be. And then I will take it and have it all scanned and made digital. And then that will be the artwork for the book. So it'll be like a, a collaboration of his people and my people and him and me and my sister's doing the cover she's an artist and so i'll have a beautiful original oil painting when she's finished that will be on the cover of the book but the other two books actually the one i'm waiting on to do last is going to be called keeping it real i'm not dumb i know how to pick titles right (laughs) that's going to be all the backstories like the one i just told you Mm -hmm. about the challenges And I'm going to wait until the attorney general is finished with their investigation and see what happens with that. And then I think I'll have the freedom to say all the backstories, everything that's happened that was not so savory and is not, you know, part of my memoir. The other one is an interesting side story. Some of your listeners will remember we had a woman named Kelly the Box Girl who told me she had a box of items that were left by a woman who was married to Edgar Davidson and that it was full of Sister Kathy's belongings. Mm -hmm. And they did their homework, but they were scamming me. And this went on for months. We had the whole world looking for Kelly. And so this is going to be, it's going to sound like a fiction, but it's not. It's going to be called Kelly the Box Girl, The True Story. So that will be more, yeah. So um, it just keeps coming out of me. I can't stop it. When you referenced the Attorney General a moment ago, you're talking about the Attorney General of the state of Maryland. Yes, Brian Frosch. And what's the status of that investigation that Mm -hmm. the Attorney General is conducting? Okay. The investigation's been going on for about two years. And there is... A guy who's in charge, his name is Richard Wolf. If your listeners want the contact information, I can give that to you later. It's anybody who has anything to report about any kind of clergy abuse that happened in Maryland, okay? Now, if they live in California and it happened here, he wants to know about that too. Now, some of these pedophiles or abusers were not priests, They were ministers, rabbis. He wants to know about all of that. The focus is mostly on the Catholic Church, but this is going to be like a replication of what happened in Pennsylvania when Josh Shapiro released that thousands of pages of information a couple of years ago and started the whole ball rolling. So the same thing will happen here. I don't know how much longer the investigation will go on. It took about two years in Pennsylvania, but I don't know what the deal is here, what the expected time frame is. But then all that information will go to the attorney general, and then he makes the decision as to whether he should convene a grand jury. And then the way a grand jury works, for those of you, I didn't know either, so I'm not acting like I know everything. I had to learn Their job is to decide if any charges should be made. Now, there are people living that abuse children. There are people living that know who killed Sister Kathy. And I think, and know who killed Joyce. I know they're living because I think I know who some of them are. And I think that a lot of institutions are going to drop to their knees. Now, I will say that about a year ago or right after Shapiro did his thing, the federal government directed churches not to destroy any files. I don't know if you remember that, but Mm -hmm. guess what happened? They destroyed the files, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly what happened. And an employee unnamed of the archdiocese, told me that's exactly what happened, and that person witnessed it. So I think this is going to be true of a lot of parishes, bishops, archdioceses, but I know it happened in Maryland, and I'm not afraid to say it because I have a, I've talked to a firsthand witness who saw it happen and knows where it went. So 
I think that as long and, and this person reported to Wolf, everybody that I've talked to has been okay about reporting to him. Right. And so I think, I don't know if I mentioned you, I loop them into an email with him and then they take over from there and I don't have to be involved. Now, he also is meeting with a lot of survivors of abuse. And it's very, very difficult for adults, especially men, to come forward and talk about being abused by a priest because they think it has the onus of being gay and it has nothing to do with being gay. It's a, a, an adult abusing a child. And he is wonderful with those people. There's always an assistant attorney, assistant state's attorney with him, um, usually a woman. So there's both a man and a woman. And folks have gone to talk to them in person. He has also gone to their homes. I know he spent hours with one friend in that person's home discussing what happened to that individual. Takes reports by phone. Usually, if there's emails exchanged, he then asks if they can talk in person. Mm -hmm. And if I have information, like let's say you tell me, Kristen, that you saw somebody burying something and I could tell him that he would say, well, I need to talk to Kristen. So mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that's hard for people. So far, everybody has come through and everybody has said how wonderful he's been and that he's very easy to talk to. He's not judgmental. Of course, he's on our side. It's the first time somebody's on our side. So I'm an advocate and I'm a loud one. Uh, we're still hoping the statute of limitations changes and is eliminated for reporting abuse in Maryland. And right now, I don't know what our legislative session is going to look like, but I'm hoping to be able to testify. I've never done it before. The survivors have, but I feel comfortable enough. And if I don't have to drive there, because I don't drive unless somebody takes me, I feel comfortable enough to stand up and say that, you know, somebody needs to change this. And I'm not going to, I'm not shy that people know who I am. I'm proud of that. And I want to be a face for people who don't have a voice. I'll be their voice. I'll, t I'll say what they need to say if they need me to. What is the statute of limitations on reporting abuse in Maryland? I'm just curious. Uh, you, yeah, it's a little confusing for me. That's Abby's territory. But basically right now, it's my understanding that you can be 35 if you are if it if you're 35 years old you are within the statute of limitations if it happened to you as a child we would like to see it eliminated and there is some disclaimer in there that if this happened and that happened and there's something called a look back window, that's not my forte. So I would need to get you some information about that. I don't want to sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. I just know that it needs to be eliminated because a lot of people aren't ready until they're until they see the keepers or until they're 50 years old. Sure. And, the, and there's no statute of limitations on the crime of rape, which is, which is what happened to most of these people. But there has to be evidence. Now, a civil case, it doesn't have to be beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's a preponderance of evidence so that you could get a civil suit going. And that's what we're hoping for because, you know, nobody was doing rape kits. Nobody was going to the hospital. Joseph Maskell was taking girls to a, a gynecologist or crooked gynecologist and doing illegal abortions so that they wouldn't get pregnant. Yeah. So it's got so many sinister. It's such a sinister web of network and conspiracy and horrible people. And we need to make the world better for kids and for each other. So if that's if that's part of my job, I'm taking it. I well, can't if, think of a better reason, right, is to help kids and each other. I think that's why we're here anyway, right? Yeah. Well, I personally will drive down to Maryland and take you to Annapolis. Oh, right. If, if need be, here? and think how much fun we'd have on the road trip. Oh, my God. That would be road amazing. Trip. I'm going to take you up <laughs> on that. Okay, that would be great. We'll have to wait and see. I think COVID might have another plan, but we'll see about that. Well, um, you know, Kristen and I have talked about we had always planned to meet Kristen's in Virginia. I'm in Connecticut now, and we were going to meet in the middle, which is kind of roughly where you are. And we it were going to, we were going to, you know, do face to face interviews. 
This is yes. great, but it's not quite as much fun as being together all in the I same know. room. And we could arrange that once things settle down. On a serious note, we will absolutely mm-hmm. include contact information for Richard Wolf Thank from you. the Maryland Attorney General's office yes. in the show notes for these okay. episodes. I'll text you all, or I'll send you an email with all that in it. I'll send you his email and his phone number for anybody that needs it. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. One of the most frequent questions we're asked here at Mind Over Murder is, how can I help? Thanks to Othram, a leading forensic DNA testing lab for law enforcement, you can get involved and help solve real cases. If you have tested at a consumer genetics company, you can contribute your data to dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just two simple steps. Your DNA might be the missing piece that helps solve the identity of an unknown person. Then Mind Over Murder will highlight cases Othram is working on to seek your crowdfunding support for DNA testing to help solve these cold cases. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. It's easy, free, and confidential. Then join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Othram and dnasolves.com. In these stressful times, everyone needs some time to chill out and relax. That's why we're excited to announce this week's sponsor, Boston Green Health. Boston Green Health is a local provider of CBD products that specializes in oils, topicals, gummies, and edibles. Boston Green Health's plant-based products can provide natural relief and rest for the mind, body, and soul. As one of New England's premier hemp-based companies, they offer a variety of all-natural CBD products that use a blend of locally sourced hemp extract. Visit bostongreenhealth.com for premium CBD oil, a delicious variety of CBD-infused gummies, luxurious handcrafted topicals, and a product line for pets. Mind Over Murder listeners can receive 20% off any purchase by using show code MOM20. Boston Green Health takes pride in being New England's most trusted CBD brand. Visit bostongreenhealth.com and use show code MOM20 for 20% off any purchase. Do you like our show Mind Over Murder and want to create your own podcast? Well then, let us tell you about Anchor. First of all, it's free. And who doesn't love free, right? I like free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more platforms. And you can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I like the sound of that. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Right here, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started on your own podcast. You can tell them Kristen and Bill from Mind Over Murder sent you. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. Yeah, we want to talk a little bit more about how are you going to space out the book releases that you're planning? You've got a really ambitious program going on yeah, here. Yeah, sure. But you know what? It doesn't scare me. I love to write. And I'm never bored and I'm never lonely here, even in the off season. So I will probably publish the Teddy book next year and let that do its thing. With the retail release of Keeping On, we might need to do a second printing. So I'm going to wait and see what happens because there's been a lot of interest in it and a lot of pre-orders done. And they keep track of all that. They keep track of the inventory and they'll let me know if we need to do it again. So I think that I will need the winter I would like to write the Kelly the Box Girl story, which is going to be less technical and more of a almost not a fiction story because it's not, but it's going to be feel more that way. And then I'm going to wait for all hell to break loose. And that's when I'll write keeping it real. So what I do (laughs) is in my writer head, I write notes constantly. If I think of things that I want to put in one of the books, 
I just, I keep it just a composition book and I'll put down, like I have a section for the Teddy book. I have a section for the, the Kelly book and I'll put down things that I need to remember to include. And then I'll, I'll do like the proposal format works for me. I had never done a book proposal before, but it does help you organize your, it's like an outline. And it's always good to present those to agents and publishers. I can't get an agent. That was a big wake up call for me. It's like, wait a minute, I can't get an agent. I was in Netflix. Like I was, I mean, you know, being honest, right? And I was like, wait a minute, I'm Jet Ma. I can't get an agent. No, you can't get an agent. Nobody wanted to do it. So the publisher I'm working with, it's not self publishing, it's called a, a hybrid model. So the agent is taken out of the middle and they do the work and I do the writing. And then there are some fees up front, but then they do all the work and I just write. So it was the best model for me. And I'm probably going to stick with them because I really like the way they operate. They're really professional. They vet everything they accept. They don't take everything. I learned that's called vanity press. Right. Just pay company to do what, whatever you send them, they print. No, I didn't want to do that either. So Mascot has a great reputation. If there's any writers out there, I recommend you look at their webpage because they're doing a great job and they have great marketing people and they have worked really closely with me every step of the way. I have not had any hiccups with it at all. So it's all working out okay. And we'll be back with more with Gemma Hoskins after these messages. We're back with Mind Over Murder and Gemma Hoskins. Gemma, moving back to the television series, The Keepers, my partner Pamela and I watched the show. We were literally on the edge of our seat, leaning forward, just so excited to watch it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was so compelling. Has anyone ever talked about doing another season of The Keepers? It was such an amazing story. Right. That's a really good question. First of all, none of us saw it until all of you saw it. So I was on the edge of my seat, too. (laughs) (laughs) We only saw the trailer. If it wasn't an episode we were in, then, I mean, I wasn't at Jean's house when they were talking with her or walking in the park. So that was all brand new to us. Okay. I watched the trailer like a hundred times because I just thought it was kind of fun to watch a movie trailer that I was in, right? It was just kind of surreal. But anyway, okay, second season, that will not happen with Tripod Media. Tripod Media are the filmmakers that made The Keepers. And Ryan White is the director. The producer is Jessica Lawson Hargrave. And the director of photographer is John Benham. And he was from Baltimore. So the three of them were the team, and they used a few other photographers if John was not available, but that's the first question they get. And Ryan has said it's not going to happen. That was a very difficult time for all of us, especially him, because it was such a dark story. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of exciting for us to... You know, they were in Baltimore or around Maryland like a week or 10 days out of every month for over two years. Mm -hmm. And so if Abby and I were doing something that could wait, we'd wait for them and then go do it. Or if they wanted me to go knock on some doors, which I did a lot of, I'd wait for them. So if it was something that was like had to happen away from where they were, they would send the photographer over to cover it. Like when I spoke with Kathy's sister, Marilyn, for the first time on the phone, they were not there, but he had the camera set up. So to get to your question, it is not likely that they are going to do a season two. If they were going to, they would have been filming for the last three and a half years. Shane Waters and I did get approached. He's my podcast buddy from a company called Ratfell Productions. And they wanted to do like 10 one hour interviews with different people who were not in the keepers, but who are important to the story. And they were going to pay them and pay us to travel and all this stuff. Well, it fell through. It never happened. And I kind of felt like it wasn't going to, but you know, I'm, I'm okay with that. 
there's not really any plans to do anything like what you're referring to right now, except that I believe if the case is solved, either Kathy's or Joyce's, and let's say the attorney general in Maryland, you know, makes an announcement or has a press conference that it's been solved, I do believe that they would give the families enough time to get here so that they could witness that. Do you follow me? So they could actually be here for that (laughs) and let them know ahead of time. And I'm sure that would be filmed. But right now, no, there's no plans to do a second season. Nobody has approached me or anybody that I know that's been involved in it. I think most of the people like were drained, especially the survivors. I can't imagine what that was like for them to actually have their faces and voices out there for the world when the people that did it and covered it up were not willing to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. That that to me is incredible. That's so hard. I'm game, but nobody has actually approached that subject again. And, you know, we've lost some time now because we've covered so much that I don't know if we could go back and cover it all again. I did talk to a producer in Los Angeles who was giving some consideration to a feature film based on some part of the story, for example, maybe one of the characters or one of the events, not like a series, but a feature film that would have actors in it. I was willing to collaborate with that. It even got to the point where like, well, who would you want to be you, Gemma? (laughs) Who would you want to be you, Patty? (laughs) Do you remember we picked? We actually picked people, which is kind of silly. I thought I wanted Sigourney Weaver to be me. And yes, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted Abby wanted Susan Sarandon to be her. Wow. Now, okay. Most people said Susan Sarandon is more like me. I don't know, but <laughs> you actually you actually get to hang out with those people, and they learn how to be you. Like when Aaron Brockovich with you know Julia Roberts. She hung out with Aaron Brockovich. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, if, you're gonna, Aaron, right? if, if the person is alive, a lot of times the actors will want to meet them and hang out with them. Uh, hang, like, hang out with them. I was like, oh my God, I could have like, I could be walking around Ocean City with Sigourney Weaver. And she'd be <laughs> I mean, like, I'm such a nothing, you know, I'm like just a normal person. And so, oh, this. I, I can rise to the occasion when I need to, but um, so that didn't go anywhere. And I don't know that anybody is looking at anything like that. I have no idea. I like uh, Sigourney Weaver at, yeah. uh, as Gemma Hoskins. I think that would be I, great. I, this is the part I, when I mentioned I met Sigourney Weaver on a plane and uh, she was uh, extremely she nice. Was, she was really, really nice. Oh, well, good. I love Sigourney Weaver. She's fantastic. She's extremely tall. (laughs) What was that movie? She was like in space, in a space suit. Galaxy Quest. It's one of my favorite movies. Yeah, absolutely hysterical. What was it? What movie was that? Galaxy Quest. No, no, no. This was like, uh, not Alien. Oh, it was Alien. Yeah, she was in Alien. Was it? Well, she was in Alien 1, 2, and 3. Okay, well, that's the kind of Sigourney I wanted to be. Like, oh, okay. I'm really, I'm really hot, but like, don't mess with me. Yeah. You know. Well, that was that was badass Sigourney. Exactly. Badass Sigourney, yeah. Right. I prefer that over Bulldog. Oh my God, people call me Yellowtail and Bulldog, and I'm getting so tired of it. I don't even drink Yellowtail. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's a funny joke, and people bring it to me when they come to visit. Yeah, about the films and stuff. I think. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody, if something happens big, then I think there's going to be a whole lot of new attention to it. But right now things have kind of settled down and, you know, like the book is getting new people interested and the criminal investigation as we keep reminding people of that. So they have not put the series into DVD form yet. So I guess they're still making money on Netflix with it. Oh, that's right. 
Yeah, there's no. The only DVDs you can get are missing episodes. And I didn't know this, but before it comes out, the DVDs minus episodes are sent to reviewers. Correct. So that anybody wants to do an interview with me, like Shane or the newspaper guy down here, he was sent a copy of it, but it was only like three of the seven episodes. Right. Well, they, so well, they, enough, yeah. they don't want it to get, end up being bootlegged right. and up on the internet. Right. right. So those are on eBay somewhere, but it, you can't get it. <laughs> um, yeah, they are really the, the uh, minimal ones. Like somebody's going to be like, what is this about? But anyway, so no, you can't get it on DVD yet. And the composer <laughs> who is just flawless, Blake Neely, he did the music and he has also done the music for several other of Ryan White's films, mm -hmm. Serena and the case against eight. So when I heard the music from those, I said, Ryan, who is this guy? He's like my new composer crush. Well, the next thing I know, <laughs> I get a package in the mail with DVDs from Blake Neely and a letter from him. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. He actually wrote in his handwriting to me, blah, blah, blah. So now we're like Facebook friends, and I pretend like I know him. And But anyway, so I wanted to know, I wanted to know if the soundtrack was going to be available because mm -hmm. it's exquisite. Right. And Ryan said, no, it's never going to be available. Because mm. I said, like, when Serena, like, there's names for the different tracks, right? Like, I don't know, Success or Serena's Journey or whatever. And I thought, well, maybe there'll be, like, a, a track called Gemma, like the Gemma song. <laughs> there you and, go. Right? <laughs> Gemma song. I mean, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you think so? I'm acting so silly about this, but these are things I really think about. And so <laughs> I was like, well, I wonder what he wrote about me. And so I would watch the episodes up in. I am not drinking, you guys. I'm just sitting here. And my, <laughs> and my cat, stand, my dog standing at the door waiting for me, but he's going to have to wait. But I would like look at the episodes I'm in and listen to the music in the background and think, OK, I wonder why he did that for that scene. And then our photographer did. I love this. Did illegal drone shots over Baltimore, right? <laughs> Ooh. Uh -huh. Which, they're amazing. Unpermitted. Job, and he took one of his kids with him, one of his young teenage sons, and they would like let the drone up off of like balconies and roofs and over Baltimore <laughs> to get there's a now you're gonna have to go back and watch yeah, it, right? It, we're gonna watch it again. Yeah. But the music matches the drone shots perfectly. So I had this idea that I would have this interview with the photographer and Blake, and they could talk about how they work together, mm -hmm. but they didn't work together. It just like John would send the photography and Blake would make the. Well, it would, sounds like he would write his fit. score and cut his cues to fit the action of the drone shots. I guess. But it's it's amazing. And every time you hear that beginning music, it's so haunting. Like, I can't hum it. I wouldn't if I could. Well, yeah, I probably would. But but you know what's going on. It's a shot of Keo, And it's this very bittersweet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's very melody. powerful it's intro. It's very, very sad. But, oh, it's just, yeah, it's very poignant. But anyway, so, yeah, that's. That was the deal with the uh, with the DVD. So that won't happen for a while. Yeah, I wish somebody would do a follow up, some kind of follow up. How long did it take from beginning to end to mm. create the show? And mm -hmm. I, I know Ryan White and his team put a tremendous amount of time in, as you said. Yeah, they okay, they found Jean. They got a commitment from her before they did anything else. Right. So that was probably in late summer of 2013. And then they came out from L.A. several times to meet with her and her family. And then once she said yes, then they got in touch with me. And I can't remember how they knew to get in touch with me, probably just because I'm all over the place anyway. And so that was November of 2013. And they finished filming in January of 2017. And then all the editing, of course, they were sending stuff back. I have images of like these big reels, like when we were kids at the movies. Well, you wouldn't remember that, but like big movie reels. 
well, everything's on a little flash drive. You know, like they would take the, the film from that day and John would put it in his pocket. You know what I mean? It's not like the reels anymore. Are you there? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and so they would um, be sending that back to their California editors. Mm-hmm. And so once it was finished, uh, once it was finished filming in January of 2017, then Ryan hired a bigger team of editors and they worked 24 seven and it came out in May of 2017. So uh, that's what, how many years Four. four almost years, eight. almost yeah. four years from beginning to yeah. end. Yeah. So um, that was probably pretty long. He said the one he did called the case against date, he said that took five years and he could never do something like that again. He actually did his movie called Serena, which is about Serena Williams, right plop in the middle of doing The Keepers. So he went off to Australia oh, wow. and followed, followed her around the year she almost did whatever, Grand Slam or whatever. So that was probably real therapeutic for him to be doing something with a different kind of intensity. They've done a couple other outstanding ones since then. Ask Dr. Ruth, which is about Dr. Ruth Westheimer. And she actually was a sniper during the war. So she went with Ryan to Israel and all over Germany, showing him all these different places. And the movie was about her life. It's very, very moving. And so that came out after The Keepers. And then last year, they did one called Invisible Out on TV, which is five episodes. And that one is about the history of, it sounds odd, but the history of homosexuality on television. Mm -hmm. Like the way gay people were made fun of in situation comedies. Right. Or like, did you know Perry Mason was gay? I didn't know that. And it go each episode takes a different piece of history and shows how that has changed. And all through this, they're inter- wow. doing wonderful interviews with Anderson Cooper, Don Lemon, Adam Lambert, a lot of people who uh, Wanda Sykes. I think she's one of the producers. People who have been instrumental in bringing a a sense of uh, sensitivity and integrity to that kind of acting so right, that right. it's just, we're just people, you know, they have another one coming out soon as a feature film. It's called assassins. And that one is the story of the murder of Kim Jong Ben. Kim Jong Un's brother who was killed in a mall by two young girls. Right. And this is going to be that story. That's going to be really interesting. And I, it's going, that one's going to be in theaters, I guess, if theaters ever open and are normal. I, I was just wondering that. Even as yeah. we were talking, I was thinking, oh, my gosh, theatrical release. How's that going to work? Yeah. Well, <laughs> so far, it's not working well. very well. I know. And I think changes are going to have to be made because people aren't really comfortable sitting in a theater anymore. And that could make or break a film. But I guess getting it onto television is the best way to go now because that's what everybody's looking at. But it, it was bought by a feature film company. And that one's going to be coming out pretty soon. I don't know what they're working on now. I pester them constantly. And all I see is like pictures or like John, who lives here in Baltimore, say, well, I'm, I'm going to Vietnam. And I'm like, you sound like you're going like down the street to get a loaf of bread. But that, you know? that's what a what a Vietnam. filmmaker does is they go to wherever the project yeah. is. He said, I'm going to be filming with Ryan in, in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And so you know, I only know little pieces like that, but I'm so fascinated with the filmmaking process. To me, that's as interesting as the content. I love to know how things are put together, how the editing's done. Like I would, oh man, I would have loved to, they let me like do count, like get behind the camera once just to see what it was like. And you know, all the (laughs) mic and all that stuff. I love all that. I was like relentless looking at all their gear. I think I'm just curious about a lot of stuff anyway, so. Well, and it it is a very interesting process. And, of course, Kristen and I went through it. We appear on camera a bit, and we talk about the Colonial Parkway murders for this long, gestating television series, which will come out at some point, and we'll let everybody know when it does. Now, did you say you anticipate it's going to be released this week? No, no. We still haven't haven't heard. We're we're still waiting. Sunday. Why did I think you said Sunday? Oh, you, maybe you said someday. Someday. 
someday. someday. Yeah. Okay. Now, we'll let everyone know. For the yeah. benefit of our listeners, sure. tell us how can they follow what you're what you're doing? Where okay. where should they go on social media, okay. etc.? Okay. I'm going to tell them where not to go. Okay. <laughs> the Keepers official group page has 130,000 people on it. I would like Netflix to close that down. It attracts a lot of trash, and it's not because it's not a new series. The people that monitor it are also monitoring other newer productions for Netflix. Like, they might have five different shows that they have to monitor the pages. I have posting privileges there, so I don't have to wait for something to be approved. But if people ask to join there... They may, like, wait months. So I'm just going to say probably not there. There is a a safer page, but they'll have to answer some questions, called The Keepers Who Killed Sister Kathy. The Keepers Who Killed Sister Kathy. And my friend Shane and another friend are the administrators. It's a really good, safe place to discuss. And I post on there every week. I have a page called Keeping On With Gemma, but I have 10 moderators, and we have a list of people's names that are not permitted on there. I know, it's gotten that bad. So if people ask to join that page, if they're not invited, if they're my friends, I'll invite them. If they ask to join that page... We have to, we put them through a car wash, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. they don't answer the questions. There's four questions. And if they answer two, it's like, see you, bye bye. So you have to be so careful because of privacy. And I have had all my privacy invaded. And it's not a good feeling. So I would recommend those keep the keepers who killed sister Kathy and keeping on with Gemma. I do not post about any of this on my own Facebook page. I don't even go there. So that that would be my recommendation. I also have a Twitter handle. It's Gemma Hoskins. And if people use Twitter, there is going to be on the back of my book is my website, which is not up yet. It's GemmaHoskins.com. Very easy. But if they go there, it's not live yet. I'm waiting until the retail release date to make that go live just because I'm just learning how to create a web page. So I would recommend those. And what else? I'm trying to think if there's anything else. If people want a copy of the book, they can private message me from one of those places or from my Facebook page. They can private message me and it will show up I look in my spam folder and I look on my outside folder. So I'll find it if they, if they want to find me. Jim, thank you so much for joining us. We've so enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. I hope we can do this in person at some point. Oh, us too. Sure. I, I'm going to talk to Shane. We want to interview you guys about the, gestation of the series and <laughs> of your series so we'll hook up with you guys and hear do you want to talk about it before it airs or during or after probably after it airs okay. after okay well just let us know when is a good time and then we'll get you on our show okay sounds great thank you so much Gemma. okay i hope i talk to you guys soon take care we do too bye good night. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.